be left behind. So I recently moved to uh, Victoria, BC, so I thought I would just tell you all about my brand new city, which I'm very excited about. Um, so Victoria is um, on an island off the coast of Vancouver. So here's Victoria, this is Vancouver, and here's Seattle. So we're nestled uh, between the ocean and the mountains. And so this is actually the view of Mount Baker from our break room, which I think is amazing. Um, it, just ha it just floats there off in the distance. Um, and this is our dog park, which I think is just like mind blowing. That this, I've been to dog parks, I won't say the cities, where it's actually just like a muddy field with a fence. This is our dog park and there's a view of the mountains and it's like a spectacular place. So um, I tell you this because we are hiring six people over the next two years. Um, if you are graduating soon um, or are currently doing a postdoc and might go on the job market, uh, you should think of us. We're close to Vancouver and Seattle and I think it's going to be a really exciting place to be because we're hiring uh, a lot of really great people in the next few years. Uh, but I'm not here to talk about Victoria. I'm here to talk about language in the brain. Um, so some of the inspiration from this comes from uh, Siri. You're probably familiar with Siri, which is the personal digital assistant available on the iPhone. So Siri is great for a lot of things. Um, you can ask Siri to set you an alarm. You can ask her to make a phone call for you, set a calendar appointment, so on and so forth. But when it comes to doing things with Siri that are out of the ordinary, often Siri can't cover it. And so, for example, here's a, a case where somebody asked Siri to call them an ambulance. And Siri thought that they meant literally for the, that this person's name was an ambulance. So this is an example of a, you know, extreme edge case with Siri where um, typical language processing um, techniques might not cover. So Siri suffers from something called the long tail. So 80% of the things you want to do with your phone, your iPhone, can be covered probably with rule-based techniques. Um, it's the same thing over and over again. That they typically follow the same form, and it's easy to do. But the remaining 20% get progressively harder to cover. And so I think it uh, is an example of an area where it might start to make sense to take inspiration from the way that um, people process language in order to build computer programs that do it better. So in the past, people have built semantic models using huge amounts of text data. Um, and recently, people have started uh, extending those ideas to include vid videos as well as uh, pictures and images. And so part of my work is extending that further to say, can we include data from brain imaging experiments or other ways of uh, recording brain activity in order to improve our models of language and semantics? So I call this semantics plus plus. We're going to um, move beyond just the things that um, have typically been used in semantic models. So if you're familiar with the 2008 paper that um, Matt was talking about, it was an example of using these semantic models built from large collections of text in order to understand how the brain represents semantics. So my research brings that full circle. We're going to now take brain imaging data in order to improve models of semantics that are built from text. It's also an interesting example of uh, big data and little data. So there's a huge amount of, brain, of uh, corpus data available. But when it comes to brain data, it's expensive to collect and it's also time consuming to collect. You just can't get people to sit in a scanner long enough to collect enough data so that it would be considered really a big data problem. And so this is going to probably never change. It will probably always be the case that brain data is hard to get your hands on. And so the question is, can we use the huge amount of text data that we have in order to improve our ability to learn from little data resources like brain data? And so I think you can extend that beyond just the brain data problem space into other areas where you don't have enough data to call it big data. So I'm interested in the brain for several reasons. The first is that um, although it's been studied for a long time, there's still a lot of unanswered questions when it comes to brain science. So I think there's still a lot of uncovered ground and low-lying fruit in brain science, especially when it comes to how the brain processes language. And it's also true that if we understood how the brain processed language, we could probably do a better job of um, di diagnosing and treating brain diseases and neurological disorders. And like I touched on before, if we understood how the brain did particular tasks, we might be able to take inspiration for that in, from that and improve our algorithms for doing the same task. So here's the outline of today's talk. We'll start with uh, the exciting stuff. I'm sure you all want to hear about brain imaging and semantics in the brain. And we'll touch briefly on semantic models of um, tech built from text. And then the two projects are a project that combines brain data and text data into one model. And the last one is where we talk about semantic composition in the brain. So first, the fun stuff. 
Um, so we'll talk about two kinds of brain imaging technology that I use in my research. The first is fMRI, which you might be familiar with. And the second is MEG, magnetoencephalography, which is a um, somewhat less famous brain imaging technique. So an fMRI machine looks like this. It's essentially like a giant magnetic donut that we put your head into. Um, it gives us great spatial resolution on the order of a millimeter cube. So we can get um, many, many millimeter cubes over your brain and be able to measure the... Um, here what we're measuring is the change in oxygen concentration as a function of your brain's activity. But it turns out that um, oxygen concentration is just a slow-moving signal, and that just has to do with the fact that um, we're measuring a diffusion process. Sorry. Um, and so it's not that fMRI is in itself a bad technique, a bad way of measuring the brain. It's just that the, the signal we're actually measuring is smooth over time. So we don't get a very good time resolution with fMRI. We get about one brain, one brain image every two seconds. And what comes out of fMRI looks like this. It's essentially a 3D um, view of the brain. And we split it up into slices. So here we have slices starting from the bottom of the brain, going to the top. And the front of the head in each one of these slices is at the top of each uh, individual slice. MEG, on the other hand, um, is another way of measuring the brain. And its name actually perfectly describes what it does. So magnetoencephalography is magneto, meaning magnet, encephalo, meaning the brain or the head, and graphy, meaning to write or record. So we are literally recording the magnetic fields in your brain. So the magnetic fields come from the fact that each one of your neurons are sending an electrical current down their axons. And so when we have many, many uh, neurons working together on the order of 100,000 neurons pointing in the same direction, firing at the same time, we can measure that as a very small magnetic field on the outside of your head. So in order to do that, we have to put you inside of a magnetically shielded room. Uh, so don't worry, I'm not recording meg data right now. You would know if somebody was, giving, was recording meg data from you. And so... The MEG machine looks like this. It's essentially a gigantic helmet. This helmet is so big um, that you don't put on the helmet. The helmet puts on you. We put your head here, and we actually pump you up in this yellow chair up into the helmet. And this helmet is, um, the reason it's so big is it's super cooled um, conductors, and each one of them is a, a sensor. So we have 102 sensor locations and three sensors in each position that are recording the magnetic fields caused by your neurons firing. So essentially what we get out is a time series from each one of the sensor locations. Uh, it looks something like this. And so while fMRI is a 3D image of the brain, we can think of MEG instead as being a 3D video of the brain. So we have not only space, but also time as a function here. So MEG has poorer spatial resolution than fMRI. Um, it's about six millimeters cubed. Um, but it has great time resolution. We can get up to 1,000 samples per second. So if you're reading at the rate of two words per second, that's 500 samples per word. So that makes it really great for language studies so, because, of course, if you're reading more than one word a second, we would like to be able to see those words as they happen in your brain, which is harder to do with fMRI. So we'll talk about how the brain encodes concepts today, um, but first we'll just need to cover a few preliminaries. Um, if we want to train a machine learning algorithm that can tell what word you're viewing based on your brain data, we need to turn the brain data into a feature vector. So this is easy to do with MEG data. We just lay all of the time signals end to end, and that creates our feature vector. And with brain data, it's the same thing. We just stretch out all of the voxels into one long feature vector. And so then what we would like to do is train a weight matrix that takes as input the word features and produces as output some prediction of the brain activity at each voxel. So we're going to train an independent weight matrix. It takes as input the word features and produces an estimate for each one of the voxels. We'll put those all back together in order to create our original uh, brain volume and then compare that to the brain volumes that we observe in order to make predictions. Uh, so the Science 2008 paper introduced a new um, evaluation technique called the two versus two test. So we leave out two brain images and we um, train on the remaining n minus two. And then we predict two predicted brain vectors and we need to compare them to the two held out true brain vectors. So we're gonna choose the assignment of true to predicted vector that minimizes the some of the distances between the vectors. So is the dashed line here, the sum of the dashed lines shorter than the sum of the straight lines? If so, then we would choose the 
assignment, the wrong assignment here of SI to SJ hat and SI hat to SJ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, everything I'll talk about today is intersubject, um, intrasubject classification. There's nothing between subjects here. So when we talk about two versus two accuracy, we're going to talk about the number of times we did that, hold two out and choose the minimum um, sum of distances. So the two versus two accuracy is the percent of time we get that test correct. And the reason that we're doing this different test of this leaving two out is that we have two predictions in order to make one assignment. And so that allows us to, um, we have slightly better signal to noise ratio because we're using two predictions. So if one of the predictions is not very good but the other one's okay, we'll still be able to make this two versus two choice. And so it gives us better, um, a better way to measure these models. So chance is still 50-50, um, but if there's any signal to be leveraged in the uh, predictions themselves, we'll have a better chance of finding them with the two versus two test. We're also tester, testing our ability to generalize. So I said that brain data is very expensive to collect. So we would prefer to not have to collect um, brain data for every uh, word in the English language. So instead we're going to train models that can generalize to new words. So because we're representing these words as features, we can leave out two word, words entirely. So when we train, we will never have seen, for example, the word dog, but at test time, we'll be testing on words we didn't see. So for example, the word dog will be in test, but never in train. So we're testing the ability of these algorithms to generalize beyond the words they see at, at training time. So the, the first data we'll talk about well, the two data sets we'll talk about, one, the first one, the fMRI, is from the science paper. So there was nine subjects, um, and they came into the scanner and they view uh, 60 concrete nouns with uh, both the word and the picture. So for example, they would see the word dog paired with a line drawing of a dog. So they repeated this uh, exact same experiment in 2012, um, except they used magnetoencephalography instead of the fMRI. So for the science paper, they used uh, 25 verbs, and they measured the number of times that each one of the target words, for example, dog, co-occurred with um, one of these 25 verbs. So for example, if we're talking about the word dog, uh, we probably often see it with verbs like run, smell, and hear, but less often with verbs like drive, fill, and wear. And it turns out if you take um, each one of those co-occurrence statistics and scale it to be something proportional to the probability of seeing those things together, you get this neat model. So, for example, the verb eat, its scaled probability might be 0 0.84 for the word celery. If we learn a bunch of brain images such that when we multiply them by the scalar corresponding to the word and add them together, we get an estimate of the original um, brain image. And so that's what this model does. It learns essentially a weighted average of each one of the concepts relating to a verb, such that when you add them together, scaled by the probability, you get a recreation of the original brain image. So when you do this, you get a two versus two accuracy at about 77%, which is um, quite good. Definitely far above chance for this task. So the MEG data was uh, the same experiment, the same nine people, except um, they used a different representation, sorry, not the same nine people, but sa the same paradigm. They used a different representation of semantics. So here they have 218 questions that they asked of the 60 nouns on Mechanical Turk. So for example, um, if the target, target word is dog, we might ask people, is it bigger than our microwave oven? And people will say, yes, it's bigger, a little bit bigger than our microwave oven, so they give it a four. Is it alive? Definitely alive. Is it man-made? Definitely not man-made. And so we take each one of these ratings in this 218 uh, dimension uh, semantic space and use it in order to represent the words. And so this experiment is slightly different in that we're, here we're going to try to predict the word from the brain data rather than the brain data from the word. So you can just think of switching your X's and Y's when you train your, reg your regression. Um, and partially because of that switch of the prediction uh, that the accuracy here is, is higher, about 90% um, uh, two versus two accuracy. So uh, Meg has great time resolution like we were just talking about. So that means that um, we can look as a function of time where particular um, features are decodable. So here is um, about 100 milliseconds after the word hits the screen. So 100 milliseconds is not very much time, one-tenth of a second. 
So it's not enough time for you to begin processing the semantics of the word, but it is enough time for you ha to have actually perceived the word on the screen. So the types of features that we can decode in the brain at this point in time are things like word length and right diagonalis diagonalisness, which is um, something to do with the picture. So early in time, we can decode things that have to do with the stimulus, but not necessarily the concept. And then as we get later in time, so from 200 to 600 milliseconds, here happens to be at 450 milliseconds in the brain, we can start to decode some of these semantic features. So um, is it hollow? Does it grow? Can you hold it? Is it alive? These sorts of features start to pop up in different parts of the brain later in time. And it turns out that semantics is very distributed throughout the brain. So there's um, not one place in your brain where semantics is uh, available, but rather many, many places in your brain working in synchrony to encode semantics. So are there questions up to this point? Good, okay. So I've been talking about uh, word features. So we have our 25 verb co-occurrence, and we also have our 218 uh, semantic questions. So each one of these gives us a vector in high dimensional space that um, encodes word meaning. Uh, so I mean, um, I mean exactly this, that if you talked about these particular features of the characteristics of a word, the concept encoded by a word, they are um, encoded in different places in the brain at different times. Right. Um, so there are parts of the brain that encode um, semantics that aren't in the visual region. If that's, I'm not sure if that's exactly what you're getting at, but it's true also that a lot of um, semantic features are encoded in the visual region. And I think partially that's because these are uh, concrete objects. They're probably being um, visualized. Right, um, so that's not specifically what was done here. Um, instead, we talk about where um, things related to the image can be decoded, and those are earlier and in different places. Um, so you're right that it's not a complete proof that these things don't overlap, but um, sort of how we deal with it for this. Other questions? Okay, so we're talking about semantics. Um, and these word features, and each one of the words is um, defined by a point in high dimensional space um, that, that has to do with these word features. And so um, that probably sounds familiar to you. Uh, it is the definition of a vector space model of semantics. So you can think of each one of these word feature representations that were used previously as being um, vector space models of semantics. So if we were just using two dimensions, we might have is it alive, and is it, better than, is it bigger than a to microwave oven? So things like toasters would exist here because they're not alive and they're quite small, and horses are alive and big, so they would be on the opposite end. So we can see that using these word features, we get clusters of related things in this high dimensional space. So this is um, not a new idea. Um, the idea that you can measure word meaning by checking which words um, they co-occur with has um, been used before, and things like LSA, to create these word embeddings. So we did that. Um, we used a huge uh, corpus. Actually, this is a subset of ClueWeb, so uh, 16 billion words, 50 million web documents. And we're going to use a dependency parser to parse each one of the sentences in the uh, web corpus. So a dependency parse looks like this. We have the arcs between the words. We're going to use those arcs as our features um, in our uh, semantic space. So we're going to count the number of dependencies incident on each word and use them to create vectors. So John, for example, would get uh, its noun subject for the verb hit, incremented by one after parsing this sentence, and uh, being modified by the adjective bouncy would be applied to ball. So once we get those vectors for all of our words and all of our sentences, we end up with a huge matrix, and it has words for the rows and the columns correspond to these dependency features. So there's 1.25 million columns, which is 
um, in practice very large. And so usually people do something like dimensionality reduction to make it easier to deal with. So we would apply something like singular value decomposition to take the 1.25 million columns down into something around the order of 500. So matrix factorization, just to uh, jog your memory, we take a matrix X here would be corpus statistics. So each one of the rows corresponds to words, and each one of the columns would correspond to some sort of uh, corpus statistics. So for us, would be the dependency features. We're asking to find a matrix A and D such that their product recreates the original corpus statistics in X. So for SVD, the matrix factorization looks like this. Um, and the dimensionality reduction comes from the fact that we're going to truncate the matrix A such that we're throwing away some of the information, but we hope that we can still recreate the original matrix X with some degree of uh, accuracy. So we'll use this truncated matrix in A as our vector space model of semantics. So with techniques like SVD, we often um, lose some of the interpretability when we do this dimensionality reduction. Because after we've done dimensionality reduction, the rows still correspond to words, but now the columns correspond to latent dimensions. And it can be unclear to see what those latent dimensions actually encode. In order to show you what I mean by this, if we take a particular dimension of the latent representation, and we look at the top scoring words for that particular dimension, we can, if they have something in common, we could say that that particular dimension encodes a coherent uh, semantic concept. So if we do this for SVD, um, we get groups of words that look like this. Well, long, if, year, watch. It's unclear to see um, what these words have in common. So non-negative sparse embeddings was um, developed to deal with this uh, interpretability problem. So it's, the, it's a loss function that still asks to find a matrix A and D that recreate our original corpus matrix X, but we've, we're going to introduce a couple of new constraints. The first is non-negativity. So we want all of the entries of our latent representation in A to be greater than or equal to zero. And we also have sparsity. We want many of the entries in the matrix A to be exactly zero. And these two things together give us um, better interpretability. So here are some of the top scoring words in dimensions of a non-negative sparse embedding. Inhibitors, inhibitor antagonist receptors inhibition. It's easy to see that these words have something to do with biology, this, um, Delhi, India, Bombay, places in India, so on and so forth. It's easy for people to assign meaning to each one of these dimensions. And this comes from just in introducing these two new constraints into our matrix factorization. So now the first uh, real project, latent, re latent representations that use both brain and text data in the same model. So up until now, we've been talking about this, but we haven't said it explicitly. Essentially, each one of us has a semantic representation in our own minds, and we produce many, many measurable outputs of that semantic representation. And two of them are uh, written language, and one is, uh, the other is um, brain activity. So we can measure semantic representations based on what people write, or we can actually put them in a brain scanner and ask them to use their semantic representations and measure their brain activity while they do that. So vector space models take this written language and they turn it into some representation of words um, that gives us a vector space model. Brain activity um, is something that we can record and then we can use that brain activity in order to test the uh, utility of a vector space model or vice versa, use it to understand how the brain works. So what I'm suggesting with this project is that, well, we have written language and we have brain activity and they're essentially outputs of the same latent representation that each one of us has in our brain. So we should use them together in order to build the same vector space model. So rather than just using brain data to test, let's use brain data to create the vector space model. And then we can use somebody else's brain data in order to test the new learned latent representation. And so the question is if using brain data in order to create a vector space model gives us better representations of semantics. So um, this is the same data we talked about before. It's the 60 concrete nouns in both MEG and fMRI. Um, there's 18 subjects in total. Um, the the su nine subjects in MEG and fMRI are completely disjoint, so there's no repeated subjects in either side. Um, I tell you that because none of this data is intersubject aligned. That means that for a particular voxel, for a particular person, a particular um, activation for a particular area in the brain, I don't know what that corresponds to for any other person. And in addition, like we, d we just talked about, fMRI and MEG are very different data sources. They have very different temporal and spatial characteristics. Um, so we're going to use this data together even though we have these two problems. It's they're from different people and they're recorded using different technologies. And even though we have those two big differences, we can still use the brain data across modalities and across people. 
Um, so I've been talking about matrix factorization as being finding a matrix A and D such that product recreates X. But for the purposes of this project, I think it's easier to think of D being a mapping that takes a high dimensional corpus X, corpus statistics X, and maps it down into a lower dimensional space A. So our corpus data has A for, uh, words for each one of the rows, and we're mapping it down into a latent representation where each of the rows still corresponds to words. But let's say for some, set of, some subset of those words, we also have brain data. So we could arrange our brain data in a matrix like this. Now we have, uh, still have words as rows, but we have a subset of the words. And now the columns correspond to voxels. So we can learn a new mapping, D superscript B, that takes this brain data and casts it down into the same lower dimensional representation, A. So all of the rows of A are constrained such that they need to recreate the original corpus data X, but some subset of the rows are also constrained such that they need to re recreate the brain data Y. Uh, so the brain, sorry, the loss function looks like this. Um, you've seen this part before. This is recreating the text data X, and here's the sparsity parameter. And now we have this new term here. We're asking that some rows of the matrix A when multiplied by this mapping D superscript B, are recreating our brain data Y. So this allows us to use unpaired data. There are rows for which I have only corpus statistics, but not brain data. But I can still use it in this uh, model in order to learn a latent representation. And the rows that don't have brain data will still be able to influence the rows that do have brain data via the mapping D superscript C and vice versa. So the brain data in Y will be able to impact all of the representations in A, even if we don't have a brain image for a particular word. We can solve for this loss function using um, online dictionary learning algorithm. Uh, so we solve for the D matrices using gradient descent, and then solving for A is just lasso. So. so we solve for these two matrices in turn until some sort of convergence criteria is met. Um, it's a non-convex problem, but in practice, the solutions are quite good. Are there questions now? Okay. Yeah. Right, yeah. And the data can act on, so even though these representations have brain data and these ones don't, because they share the mappings, they can influence each other. Other questions? Okay, so the setup is like this. And our first step, we're going to do this. This is how things have been done so far. We do our text, take our text data and make a latent representation, and then a completely separate step. We take that latent representation, along with uh, brain data, and we do our, we compute the two versus two accuracy for predicting which word a person's reading. So now we're going to test our new paradigm with a different setup. So now in the first step, we're going to include somebody's brain data. We're still gonna do the matrix factorization, but now we'll get a latent representation that depends on one person's brain data. Then we'll use that person's brain data in order to test the two versus two accuracy on the remaining subjects. So we'd never use the same subject to create a latent representation and then test in the second step, but we'll still get an estimate of two versus two accuracy. So these are the results. On the x-axis, we have the number of latent dimensions. So we'll, we'll change how wide A is and see how that affects the results. And on the, the y-axis is the two versus two accuracy. So how well are we doing at predicting which word a person's reading? So the green bars correspond to including brain data. You can see as we increase the number of latent dimensions, this y, um, sorry, this yellow bar corresponds to not including any brain data. And as we increase the number of dimensions, the accuracy goes down, um, possibly because it's overfitting to the text data without taking the brain data into account. And here the green bars continue to increase, even if, so here we're testing on MEG data, even if we include fMRI, which is here the dark green, the accuracy still improves as we increase the number of dimensions. So we're getting a benefit from using a different person's brain data, even though it was recorded in a different modality, um, we're still seeing these improvements. And this is true for testing on MEG and also for testing on fMRI. So there's enough similarity, as you can think of it as the brain data forming a vector space of model semantics. There's enough similarity between the distance between words in that 
vector space model, as there are in any of the other um, brains recorded with any of the other modalities. So we get better performance across un unaligned subjects as well as even though we have different recording modalities across um, these different models. So here the test is always MEG data. Okay. And the, at train time, it was either including fMRI or MEG. And so there's a similar uh, graph for always testing on fMRI data, and the pattern is very similar. And, like, and also, you, at test time, you didn't necessarily need to. You could have left out the brain data all week. Like, you could have just used the factorization graph for text and ignored the other ones, right? So that's what this yellow bar is. Oh, but I thought that was trained without the brain data. Oh, yeah. But you I thought that's right. use the brain data to sort of regularize the text, right? To, to regularize your representation of the text. Right? So you had, I thought the point was that um, when you're training with both text and brain data, even the text representation is being affected. Uh-huh. So then it, so at test time, we could leave off the, Yeah, so I'm not totally sure that I'm following your question. So I mean, it's, it, maybe it's dumb because it's like a mismatch at test time. You're moving out some features. Oh, so right at test time, the only thing we have is the latent representation. It has been affected by the brain data from somebody else and the text data. Oh, but don't you know which row? Oh, okay. Okay, right. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. And other questions? You should not be afraid about asking bad questions because um, it's. It's about your equation. What kind of model do you think would do really well on this answer to the brain data versus a more conventional vector based evaluation? That's interesting. Well, so I think there's a correlation between brain space and behavioral space. I mean, there must be, right? Um, so what do I think would do better on? That's interesting. So I think that there, even if you had a really um, thorough behavioral data set, there are probably parts of brain activity that you just won't cover. And so I think what we're, we, we might be testing here is the ability of, for a particular model to cover the parts of semantics that aren't covered, couldn't be covered in a behavioral model. And that's actually part of what I'm trying to get at here with the, tech, the text and brain data together. Because these models get better when we include brain and text data, there must be, there's complementary information um, available. So there's some additional information in the brain data that isn't available in the text data. And so the brain data can act as sort of a patch in order to give us some of that additional information. Right, okay, so I, I, I left out a small part here, which is actually that in this model, I also have features that are related to the image that's being viewed, and those are essentially subtracted off before we do the semantic representation. So that's a good point. Um, and the model actually converges much quicker when we use those in place. So we need to account for the fact that some parts of semantics are not related to the actual stimulus, and that is explicitly created in this model. Good, good observation. Are there other questions? Uh, it's one of the neat things about this model is that we have this um, mapping matrix D superscript B, which takes our uh, brain data and sends it down as a latent representation. So we can actually look at these mappings and map them, put them back onto the brain volume um, for each latent dimension. So we have a latent dimension with top scoring words uh, bathroom, balcony, and kitchen. And it turns out when we look at the mapping matrix for that uh, set of words, we see this strong, these two strong stripes of activity. And those are the fusiform gyrus, which has been known to activate for place words. So it makes sense here that bathroom, balcony, and kitchen activate this part of the brain. Um, 
Um, another dimension has top scoring words ankle, elbow, knee. So those are body parts. And when we look on the brain, we see a part of the brain that's activated is uh, the somatosensory cortex. So this is the part of your body, part of your brain that takes care of the fact that you can feel on your body. So it makes sense that that would be mapped onto the part of your body that um, mapped onto a latent dimension that had to do with body parts. So these sorts of things just fall right out of the data, um, even though it's not actually given to the algorithm as a sort of prior. There are coherent semantic representations that map onto coherent areas of the brain. Good. Okay, so the last project is the um, neural representations of composed meaning. So up until now, we've been talking about words in isolation in the brain. So what is the representation of the word tomato uh, neurally? Now we're going to talk about what is the representation of tomato in the brain, and how does it change if it's a rotten tomato or a tasty tomato? So we're talking about now, instead of words in isolation, we're talking about words in context. So there's a lot of questions you could ask here. Are we, here are a few. Um, can we detect the adjective in the brain? Can we detect the noun? Can we detect semantic composition, so the way that the noun and the adjective interact to create the phrase? And when and where in the brain can we see those things? So we'll answer uh, most of this, these questions. We probably won't have time to talk about the noun. So this is uh, new brain data. We still have nine subjects. These are our different nine subjects, and it's a different paradigm. So we're going to have them come in, and they're going to view 38 uh, adjective-noun pairs, 20 times each. So there's here I've chosen six nouns. These six nouns were chosen because they had been shown previously to be easier to decode in the brain. And I've chosen eight adjectives such that they modulate some of the most salient features of the nouns themselves. So for dog and bear, I'm going to pair it with the adjective ferocious and gentle, hammer and shovel with light and heavy, tomato and carrot with rotten and tasty, and big and small with all six of the adjective nouns. So together, these crossings make 38 word pairs. The words are shown for 500 milliseconds in a um, serial presentation. So you'd be sitting in the scanner, and you'd see the word tasty for 500 milliseconds, followed by a fixation cross for 300 milliseconds, the word tomato for 500 milliseconds, and then a fixation cross until the next phrase for a total of three seconds between each one of the phrases. So in time, it looks like this. Uh, at zero, we'd see the adjective onset. At 500 milliseconds, adjective off offset. 800 milliseconds is noun onset and 1.3 seconds is now an offset. So these um, color of these lines will be consistent through all of the graphs in this part of the talk. So the first thing uh, we want to look at is, can we see the adjective in the brain? So as you're viewing an adjective noun phrase, can we see the semantic representation of the adjective as represented by these uh, corpus statistics? Uh, so here's the adjective onset and offset, noun onset, noun offset. And here's the end of the recording frame. So the y-axis is uh, accuracy, and this dotted black line corresponds to um, the false discovery rate threshold. So everything above that is above chance. So you can see that during the time you're reading the adjective, we can tell which adjective you're, meeting, you're reading, which is a good sign. But it turns out that even during the time you're reading the noun, we can still tell with above chance accuracy the adjective that you had been reading. And even out here, all the way out here at two seconds, there's a small blip above chance where we can tell which adjective you had been reading two seconds after you started reading it. So there's a really long sustained signature that has to do with the adjective in the brain. So one of the questions we're interested in asking is, is your representation of the adjective early in time here consistent later in the time? So that is, when you're talking about how you encode the adjective here before you've read the noun, is that in some way consistent with your representation of the adjective during the time you read the noun, your representation of the adjective late in time. So does your representation of the adjective change as a function of time? Uh, so I should have said, sorry, for each one of these um, points on this graph, it's at 100 second wide window of meg data, and they have 80 milliseconds of overlap with the adjacent windows. So in order to tell whether the encoding of the adjective changes as a function of time, um, we create this thing I call a train test matrix. So here on the y-axis is train time, and on the x-axis is test time. So for a particular row of this matrix, essentially what we're doing is training a regressor, training a weight matrix at, using the data centered at one second, and we're testing it at all other time points. So we test it for all other um, time windows. So if we looked at the diagonal 
line on this matrix, that would be exactly the graph we were just looking at, training and testing on the same time window. And so a few things point, pop out at us in this particular graph. The first is that there are these strong off-diagonal uh, components, meaning that if we train early in time and then test later in time, we can get above chance accuracy and vice versa, testing early, early in time using weight, matrix, ma weight matrices trained later in time. So this means that your representation of the adjective during the time you're reading the adjective is consistent enough with the, weight, with the representation of the adjective later in time, we can actually interchange them at train test time and still do above chance. There's also these really strong diagonal lines, which means that the pattern for the adjective representation repeats itself. So if we zoom in here, what I mean is that if I train a weight matrix on a particular point of time, if I want to do a good job decoding using that weight matrix, I need to move forward some time constant. So if I move forward a time constant, I do a good job, a good job. If I move some forward some fraction of that time constant, I'll do a bad job of decoding. So the pattern repeats itself on some frequency out here even until quite late in time. And so this is consistent across the nine subjects in this data set. These two features, the, the diagonalness and the off diagonal high accuracy. So the short answer is I don't know what it's about. It's a new finding. Um, it wasn't known before this point in time. Um, but I, I'll, I'll talk a bit about it well, now. And so essentially what we can, we can say is that, um, let's say that big has, in order to represent big in your brain, your brain goes up, 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 down, down, down. What I'm saying is that if we train a regressor on a, a weight matrix on a particular part in time, if we want to do a good job using that weight matrix to tell which word you're reading, we need to move forward some time constant. If we move forward some fraction of that time constant, the, we'll get a mismatch in the signal. And so it turns out that the width of that window, window is 100 milliseconds, um, which turns out to correspond to 10 hertz, which is the alpha band in the brain, um, which has been implicated for things like short-term memory tasks and attention. So I'm not saying that this pattern is itself encoded in alpha. I'm saying the pattern is alpha aligned. So the pattern repeats itself every uh, 100 milliseconds. So it's not necessarily encoded in the alpha band frequency, but it has a relationship and it's time locked to something in the alpha band. So we want to know if this is a statistically significant result, these off diagonal oscillations. Um, so here is uh, the same matrix that we were just looking at, except I've thresholded it for false discovery rate, because we're doing a lot of uh, multiple comparisons here. In order to increase the statistical power, I'm, I'm um, combining tests on the off diagonal. So here we're training at time two and testing at time one. We're going to combine that with the test, um, the statistical, statistical test of training at time one and testing at time two. So I combine them into one test, which is why everything below the diagonal here is dark blue. I'm not doing any statistical tests below the diagonal. I'm combining them together to one statistical test. So that allows me, that gives me better signal to noise ratio because under the null hypothesis, I would have, both of those would be uh, not good. It doesn't matter which way I train or test. If there's no relationship, it would be um, a bad situation. But if it's a good situation, then I'll have some, I'll have a better chance of picking it up if I combine the off diagonal tests. So because of that, I've left off the diagonal where we're training and testing on the same window. Um, so you can see that the off diagonal component is above chance. Um, and the oscillations also are above chance. So this is combined across the nine subjects. Other questions about this? Sometimes this is hard to parse this training and testing on different time windows. But the important part, the important things to measure, remember here are that the representation for the adjective shows up late in time in a way that's super consistent, way more consistent than we would have thought of, given that you're actually composing it with a noun at this point in time. And also, there's this oscillation, this repetition of the same pattern over and over again. So you can think of, I mean, that's probably how your brain is remembering, right? You need to keep some sort of pattern available in your mind in order to use it later in time to do the uh, semantic manipulation that you need to do to understand language. Uh-huh. 
Yeah, so that's, um, that's definitely true, and I would... Um, we have some data from sentences where we weren't able to recreate this effect. So I think that the adjective noun composition here is um, the, the signal we're seeing is is very strong, and it's it's not as strong when we're doing natural sentence reading. Um, but I also think that there's some element of this that needs um, that is necessarily related to composition. Um, because the task is to compose. Um, I also think, though, that the adjectives I chose for this um, experiment are mostly uh, intersective, meaning that the reason rotten is rotten uh, doesn't depend much on the noun. And I think um, part of the reason we're seeing this is because it's these kinds of intersective adjectives. Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, so I did want to, the whole point of this was just to see semantic composition. Everything I've shown you up to this point was actually, you know, interesting po things that came out and weren't actually what I was looking for. So what I'm looking for is semantic composition. I want to see where the adjective and noun work together to create a different meaning, a meaning that's different from the adjective and different from the noun. So you can think of the adjective noun as um, being combined by some function f um, that works to create the meaning of the phrase. So this is work that has been done before. Um, trying to estimate the function f such that we can recreate the semantics of the phrase from the constituent words. Um, but it's up until now, we don't know what this true composition function is, and so I'm actually going to completely sidestep that problem um, by asking people to use their mental representations to do this composition for me. Um, so I'm going to ask people, I'm going to give them behaviorally, using Mechanical Turk, I'll show them the adjective noun, and I'll ask them to apply their own personal composition function f to make their mental representation. I'm going to query them about that mental representation in order to create uh, the behavioral vector that we had for the nouns alone. So it's not the same behavioral vector, but you can think of it as a representation of the phrase. So the questions we asked them were things to do with size, edibility, scariness, and manipul manipulability, which are the adjectives, the things the adjectives we chose manipulate. So the questions were like, is a tasty tomato bigger than my grip? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so we see that um, tastiness does not change size, per se. Uh, okay. So we have the same graph here where the blue line represents our ability to do this two versus two decoding uh, based on the behavioral phrase. And so uh, we only saw one point above chance here. This is a, a fairly... Um, you know, statistically tight test. So I think that this one point is above chance, and it happens also to, well, it is above chance by this, but I don't think it's a false positive because it correlates with this um, above chance point here where the adjective also pops above chance at this point in time. And it also is the beginning of the time in the train time matrices we were looking at where the representation of the adjective reappears. So while this wasn't, we only found one point above chance, I think that this is a true effect, that we can see the composition of adjective and noun in the brain. And it starts at about two seconds after you started reading the adjective, and 1.2 seconds after you read the noun. Uh, so there's been some previous work in um, neurolinguistics trying to find the part of the brain that turns on when you're doing composition. So here we're talking about not the part of the brain that encodes semantic representations, but rather the part of the brain that is differentially activated whether you are or are not composing words. So for example, are you reading a word list or are you actually composing adjective nouns into phrases? So the two areas of the brain that act activate when you're composing words are the left inferior frontal gyrus and left anterior temporal lobe. So what we can do is look at, do this exactly the same experiment except only use MEG data from these particular regions of the brain. So here's the train time matrix uh, false discovery rate corrected for the temporal lobe. And you can see we can decode what adjective you're reading, but we don't get the same off-diagonal effect. So there's not the same strong um, resurgence in this particular area of the brain. And a similar pattern for the inferior frontal gyrus. So we don't see um, the semantic representation being uh, recalled in either one of these areas that have been correlated with semantic composition. What we do see is very strong activation in lateral occipital cortex. So this is the part of your brain that has been previously uh, correlated with, previously known to be where we have vision encoded. Um, so it was brought up previously that this might be crazy, um, 
crazy talk. And so there's a, a couple points of evidence that I think um, they don't prove that this isn't crazy talk, but there's strong evidence for it being sane talk. Um, the first is that um, previous research has shown that semantic features are encoded in that part of the brain. It's later in time. Um, in fact, um, some previous research found that of all of the areas of the brain, that is the part of the brain where you can encode the most, decode the most of uh, semantic features. Of the 218, there are 69 semantic features that we can decode in this particular area. Um, in addition, if we zoom in on this, uh, the very leftmost part of this graph, you can see that if we train on a point in time that has to do with the visual representation, so from zero to 200 milliseconds where we're most often where we see features that are related to the actual stimulus itself and less to do with the semantics, we don't see any off-diagonal um, decoding accuracy. So this is so stark that you can see it without that box, that if we train on a time when you should be decoding, encoding things that only have to do with the stimuli, that's not useful for decoding later in time, meaning that you're not just recalling the actual text string itself here, you're, in, you're recalling something that has to do with the semantics. So there, um, the novel findings here were that this adjective representation repeats itself on the alpha frequency. And we also see that it, the representation reappears at two seconds, or 1.2 seconds after the onset of the noun. So previous research had been looking for composition effects very early in time, about you know, two to 400 milliseconds after the onset of the noun. And so this is evidence at least that there are compositional processes that happen much later in time than people had previously been looking. Uh, so we talked about two projects. We talked about how brain data can improve uh, latent representations of semantics, and we also talked about how we can use those semantic representations in order to study how the brain does composition. Um, so I want to thank my uh, collaborators, including uh, Tom Mitchell, my previous advisor at CMU, as well as Brian Murphy and Partha Tulukdar, who are the main contributors to this work, but also all of the uh, members of the CMU Brain Imaging Lab. Uh, thanks. Any more questions? I'll take them now. Uh -huh. I may ask about the semantics about almost like the last slide. Uh, according to your data, the semantics comes in play quite late, like the second or something. But, uh, you know, when you look at like uh, uh, ERPs, mm -hmm. like semantic violations, they show up much earlier. How does it, how can I uh, compare these things, or how can I put it together? It seems like that. We are already aware of the semantic violations, not Yeah. Um, so I think there's probably some um, feed forward things that are violated at that point in time that are not full semantic representations. Rather, they're expectations of what. So uh, he's talking about, like, if I. Um, the man buttered the bread with socks. So when you see the word socks, you're. Um, your brain reacts in a very strong way, and it's about 600 milliseconds after the time you start reading socks. Um, so we're, we have some feed-forward information. We're looking for a particular kind of word to fill that slot. And when we find something else, we're, there's some part of semantics that's the processing that can be done quick enough that we know that it's a semantic violation. But the composition, when it proceeds as normal, when we get a word that we expected to see, that semantic composition, I'm saying, happens later. Yeah. Uh-huh. So also a question about uh, semantic composition. Uh, there are some, uh, there's some non-compositionality in the compounds. Uh, where maybe there's a property that neither the adjective nor the noun displays, but then the compound displays it. But I'm interested in what that takes in. So, for example, if you had a globulinous property, then uh, you know, rotten tomato would have it, even though rotten and tomato might not individually have, have globulinous. Uh, yeah, so I didn't specifically. You know, hot dog is the kind of extreme example. Uh -huh. uh, right. Where, you know, somehow canine needs to get turned off and food needs to get turned off. Uh, yeah, so we didn't actually look for that here. Um, but if I had this to do over, I would be looking for more of those sorts of intersections that don't, um, that don't come from the adjective or the noun. Um, and some of what I want to move forward on working on is looking for um, sentiment and how, s so I, I think part of the problem with this work is that there, there isn't the same interpretability of dimensions, so it can be hard to see where gloppiness is. What is gloppiness and where, does it, where is it represented in these vector spaces? So if you turn it into something simpler like sentiment, and we have phrases where the, f the sentiment between the two words in the phrase is mismatched. When can we see the sentiment of the phrase itself represented? So how can you do the processing of the individual sentiment of the individual words, but some still how somehow get to the sentiment of the phrase? Okay. 
so sort of traveling through um, a simpler concept in the words yeah. and modulating it rather than something more complex. I think there are non compositional examples already in the set of the community. Mm -hmm. Yes, so absolutely. Um, predictable movie is bad. Uh, even though predictable is good, that's an example from John Yeah, good. So these and, are. And then there's the obvious stuff like not bad. Mm -hmm. uh, is good, right? Yes, of course. So these are the sorts of things that I think we could um, follow in the brain in order to study semantics in a more controlled way, at least one aspect of it. Okay. So EEG, commercial grade EEG, the kind of thing that you can buy and, and use in your home is becoming more and more popular. And I think that, um, well, what I hope will happen is that there are, there become, um, there are groups of people who come together and create data sets from their own brain data, sort of in like a citizen science type way. Um, and when that starts to happen, we'll have, so the commercial grade brain things that you can buy, the commercial grade EEGs are of poor quality. They're not, they're not as good as you, something you would get in a medical grade equipment, but they're pretty good. And so if we have enough data from enough people doing a, a diverse set of tasks, can we start to build models from those uh, huge data sources? I think that, um, yeah, that's something I hope happens. We'll see. Yeah. As for the actual physics of the medical, like the actual sensors, I'm, that's out of my depth. But. Do you have a question? Um, we'll see whether we have some of the non-successful ideas that we use, like baseball, So that wasn't a, an analysis I did, but I think it's a good one because um, that's exactly what we're looking for, right? The, the, these, those sorts of adjectives. And so um, we did a follow-on experiment where we put the adjective noun pairs at the beginning of sentences and then asked, I actually used speed and size and uh, something else. Um, and asked, so like a, a fast turtle is not as fast as a slow car even, right? So um, the meaning of fast can't be fully processed till you get to, to the meaning of the adjective uh, noun. So can we see that you know, difference in the brain? So that didn't work very well because they were in these sentences and it turns out that it's very hard to see the adjective meaning in the sentence itself. So um, that wasn't super successful, but that was definitely a direction I was thinking of going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't actually know why. Um, it, it could be the time that we're trying to find. So the time here, 1.2 seconds after the onset of the noun, you're still reading the sentence in the experiments that we had. Um, and so we're actually looking for a signature of the adjective at the very end of the sentence once you're done reading the whole thing. And it just, it just wasn't salient enough to pick up. I mean, it must be there, but. Yes, except for that they were in a brain scanner and it's on a screen one word at a time, but oh, okay. yeah. yes, one at a time. Yeah, and so I'm looking for, so it was like the fast truck went down the street. And so I'm looking for fast truck, either during the time you read fast truck or anywhere else in the sentence, including after you're done reading the sentence. And we couldn't find the signature for fastness in, or at least differentially represented between fast truck and fast tomato, fast turtle, sorry. No, so we can find truckness, but not the fast truckness. So, I, so it seems like in sentences, the salient thing at the end of the sentence, once you're done reading, the verb is super salient. And the noun, if it's an active sentence, the, um, the agent of the noun verb is salient at the end. But I guess not the adjective part. I don't know. So, I mean, maybe in a different experimental setup, you'd be able to find it. But if you said the agent is salient, that's true, but in a passive sentence. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, subject is salient in both, yeah. but the agent is only salient in active. I shouldn't yeah, speak too much before those are published, but that was the general, yeah. Just, but the verb is very salient in both cases. Mm -hmm. It makes me wonder about the uh, you know, uh, topic comment uh, and you know, other kinds of information structure. Uh, it's easier to get in other languages because you know what you have to do. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I think branching it to other languages here would be really interesting. Especially, I mean, adjective noun pairs even. You could do noun adjective in other languages. Sorry, say it again. Oh, um, they changed enough to have different performance on a behavioral task. So if I talked only here about testing it on brain data and seeing that it did a better job on brain data, but we also tested it on a behavioral task and found that if we included brain data, the representations were um, more, more consistent with behavioral data about the words. Um, so they changed um, enough to be able to detect it. Um, so I did do, I did have some sort of qualitative results where I saw that um, polysemous, polysemy in the words was decreased. So like the word, one of the nouns is chair. So we have two meanings of the noun chair. And if we include brain data, then one of those meanings is turned up a lot. The actual physical chair is the thing that people are thinking about. And so it's the meaning of the, that we see more represented in that embedding. That's kind of a roundabout way of answering your question. Yes. Yeah, so, well, it's interesting to think about, and whether the thing that would be more salient after you're done reading the phrase would be the adjective or the noun. Um, I think those are really interesting questions. And, uh, yeah, I haven't done the experiments in other languages, but, yeah. Thanks, guys.